Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, again, my name is Miriam, and I'm happy to present today about traditional seed sowing. Um, I am a member of our Wild Child um, network of organizations of organic and sustainable gardening um, companies. And I am a member of Plant It Further, which is an organization that helps to teach about natives. But today we're not talking about natives, we're gonna be talking about seeds and how to start seeds. So um, without any uh, further ado, I'm going to get started. Let me get over here. There we go. So why do we garden? We garden to have a space with attractive foliage for structure and for produce to interact with. We garden to obtain food or flowers grown in conditions controlled from start to finish by us. We connect with our roots. Many of our ancestors were farmers or gardeners before us. And we garden to enjoy the outdoors, to connect to the earth, a way to view nature, to decompress, to relax, and to understand the ecosystems and participate with them. We garden to expand our knowledge. There's always more to learn. Gardening is also a great way to reduce stress in our lives and to provide an outlet for creativity. Gardening is the art that uses flowers and plants as paint and the soil and the sky as canvas. I love that quote. It's by Elizabeth Murray. What defines a gardener for you? I think it's a relevant question and it's a question that I ask myself and one that I answer every day when I go out into the soil. Today, we're gonna jump into some traditional seed sowing so that you can learn and master the art of successful growing of your own plants. As you can see, there are many ways to start seeds. Nature starts seeds via wind, dispersal, animals and birds spread seeds through their droppings after consuming fruits or seed heads of flowering plants. Winter sowing is a new and exciting method that mimics nature by creating mini greenhouses outdoors and avoids some of the challenges that we face of seed starting indoors. And we'll get into that in a minute, but that is for another class. And it is a very fun way to learn, but it's something we do in the middle of the winter. Traditional seed starting is an advanced gardener skill. So even if you're a beginner, it is something that takes practice and takes work. If you haven't tried this yet, or if you have, there may be some bumps and trials along the way. So welcome to the Gardener's Adventures Club. Perhaps you've suffered with the best of us to nurture your seedlings to grow and survive with this method. I'm here to let you know you are not alone. Even those master gardeners and professional nursery bosses amongst us admit that this is tricky and delicate business. I'm here to teach you how it's done and help you with some tips and tricks to understand this method and overcome the frustration it includes as best as I can. So what do plants need? I like this fun little acronym that I found and it's very useful to remember with our gardens, especially when starting seeds. What do plants need? All plants thrive with correct placement and wither with poor placement. All plants thrive with the right amount of moisture, the wrong amount and it may drown or dehydrate. All plants thrive with the correct amount of air for respiration. This happens on the underside of the leaves and actually at the roots. Roots do need air as roots absorb oxygen primarily through root hairs for cellular and overall metabolism. And all plants thrive with nutrients to the roots for food uptake to their vascular system. Plants take up essential elements from the soil through their roots and from the air, mainly consisting of nitrogen and oxygen through their leaves. 
All plants thrive with appropriate temperatures that help plants maintain their growth processes at an optimum level. The right range of temperature affects transpiration and helps plants to maintain their water content. And all plants thrive with sunlight for photosynthesis, the process within a plant that converts light, oxygen, and water into energy. Plants require this energy in order to grow, bloom, and produce seed or reproduce. All these parts are interdependent. Without the right placement, a plant, may not, a plant may not be able to access nutrients or sunlight. If the temperature isn't right, a plant may not be able to utilize any liquid. It's way too cold or hot, frozen or scalding. If a plant is placed too closely, it may not have good air circulation around the stems or roots and may be crowded or too crowded to access light or nutrients. And coincidentally, Let's look at this list again. What do all of these things plant needs remind you of? Well, they're all things that humans need too. And all organisms need these things, showing that we're all very much alike and we're all part of the same fundamental ecosystem. So there are some advantages to starting our own plant now that we understand what plants need. By starting our own plants indoors, like commercials nur commercial nurseries do, and putting your plants out when it warms up, you've gained yourself a major advantage and a jumpstart on the season. Well, what does this mean? Each plant has a window of time that it needs to grow, and some of those windows are very long. If you start that window indoors, you can extend your season beyond your region and allow yourself more time to grow things. If you plan ahead and build an indoor growing system yourself, you can build a rack and a grow system, for instance, it's gonna pay off in the returns you get by being able to start your own plants, which is significantly less expensive than buying seedlings at a nursery. Creating your own indoor seed starting station, you can have a major return on your investment if you use your station year after year. Also, this savings extends to getting a jump start on fall plantings, growing indoor plants, and microgreens too, all of which can be done with your indoor seed starting system. When you want to grow anything or eat anything that isn't native to your zone, you have to consider how long it takes that seed from sprouting all the way to maturity in the place where it originates from. You don't have to be an expert. All this information tends to be on a seed packet and you can use it as your guide. It will tell you exactly how many days from germination to maturity. So many seeds nowadays, whether cultivated or collected, and saved heirloom varieties have the data all laid out for you on the packet. So you have the best chance of success from growing from seed. But you also have to consider the length of the growing season where you live. In other words, do the days of sunlight and warm so soil where you live match the requirements for the plant that you wanna grow? To know how long the growing season is in our area, we look for the last frost date in the spring, to the first possible frost date in the fall. Our growing season here in Pittsburgh is around 170 days. That's important to note. Most cold loving plant families do well if you start them four to six weeks before the last frost date. So they're actually hardy little transplants and you can put them out right at the beginning of our season after the last frost date. But you want them to have that head start when it's cool to put them outside. Warm season crops don't need this and have a shorter growing season, meaning they're faster growing from germination to maturity and they want to be direct sown in warm soil outdoors. When you grow plants from seed yourself, you have an opportunity to grow all kinds of varieties of food and flowers that aren't available at the grocery store and flowers that aren't either at the nursery. The nursery, for example, has a limited amount of varieties they commit to sell so that they can get the best return of their investment. If they had even a portion of the unusual or varied kinds of cucumbers and tomatoes that exist, 
they would not actually be able to sell them all and they would probably lose money. So they limit their saleable options. The same goes for industrial grocery stores. There are only really one or two kinds of eggplants or celery at the grocery stores. But this is because they have an industrial chain of supply and they commit to shipping and bulk ordering and their estimation of their saleable goods. This is where growing from seed yourself is a huge advantage. Did you know that there is pink celery? And there are Japanese eggplants that are white that look like little fingers that wiggle in the wind. Did you know there are over 10,000 varieties of tomatoes in every color of the rainbow with many different kinds of flavors? You can grow all of these yourself from seed. And with practice, you can get better and better at things that are a little bit more finicky. Growing from seed yourself, there's a cost savings. If you head out to the nursery or even look at line, online at a nursery or a flower garden that you love, you're likely to spend $3.99 at a minimum for the teeniest little sprout of a plant or $29.99 for a much larger, more mature plant and that isn't even considering inflation. If you've been to a nursery lately, you know it's a very um, dire situation at the moment. But seeds are cheap comparatively. When you grow indoors and at scale, your cost savings can be great. And lastly, and most importantly, knowing where your food is coming from on an intimate level, in my opinion, is the very best part of growing for yourself knowing exactly how your plants are grown, what they're growing in, tending to them with love and care, your energy and time, that is priceless. Now, for the disadvantages to seed starting, let this long list light a fire in you to get challenged and not discouraged. When you initially begin, there are a lot of things that you need to get your grow station set up. There's lighting, there's racks, containers, seed starter, and a heat mat. There's labels and fertilizer and fans. It's a lot and it's complex. And if you leave any part of it out, it doesn't work. Trust me, I've done it wrong several times trying to cut costs here and there. But we'll cover this in a little bit. Daily care of your seeds and baby plants is everything you're doing for 45 to 60 days. Remember, we're attempting to mimic mother nature and all of her processes. And so we're constantly paying attention to airflow, monitoring temperatures. We don't want things too hot or too cold. You are being the sun going up and down and your approximation of light to the soil is absolutely essential. Seed starting is a science and an art. You're monitoring your water. If you give your seeds too much, they will die. If you give them too little, they will die. You're controlling your heat with the heat mats and the ambient temperature, mimicking the effects of sunlight on your soil and making sure that seeds germinate faster with warm soil. The time for the setup is a lot. Maybe this isn't the right season for you. You need to think all of this stuff through. And it takes conservatively 15 to 20 minutes a day to seed tend, monitor growth, repot to bigger pots, and move your plants around for airflow. Do you have enough room as your plants get bigger and you repot? Do you have a good relationship with the people that you live with who are willing to take your teeny little seeds and let them become bigger plants as they take over your space. The first three years I tried this, my beautiful toddler who's sitting in the other room, who's now a 16 year old, dumped all of my seeds to play with the soil, three years running. Then after that, after he abandoned that fun activity, my cats decided to munch all of my beautiful seeds. This is a labor of love. So you have to be prepared for the challenges that might come your way. And 
if you have a great setup and everything's going your way, you might find that there are some tiny little diseases that come for the delicate little lives of your plants. There are some um, soil-borne fungal diseases that like the damp conditions that come with a seed starting setup. Um, there are little fungal issues. There's damping off, which is something that happens in soil when your conditions are just right. Some plants are tricky, not only because the seed itself might be hard to germinate, but the plant might be temperamental. There's actually a list of the 10 hardest plants to grow from seed. Some have long growing periods, but prefer cold temperatures, which are tricky like cauliflower, or need lots of long days of heat, which are hard to come by except for in the very hot, hottest of climates like musk milk. And some attract the most prolific of pests like aphids and need moderate temperatures like artichokes. And the seeds of some like castor beans need nicking and sanding and cold stratification to even come out of their hard shells. But all of it is worth it if you can make it happen. And you can, believe me, it is beauty when these things sprout. Let's talk about germination rates. With traditional seed starting, which is what we're getting to here, a 50% germination rate is considered very successful. A respectable rate is 70%. If you are getting a rate like that, good job. Be proud of yourself. Gardening is a journey and the enjoyment of it is up to you. You can be that person who complains about your one tomato that grew and say, this is my $20 tomato. Or you can be that person who is satisfied with the experience and the knowledge that you've gained. There's no reason to do this if you don't want to. So it is really about your journey and your attitude. You can try your hand to grow indoor herbs or ginger if this isn't your thing. You can grow microgreens, that's much easier. You can grow house plants. You decide what you're going to do. Some seeds are easier than others, and some seeds really do need to be direct planted outside. We're going to get there in just a second. Let's get started. Your grow station is the first thing that you need to pay attention to. It needs to be a place that isn't going to be bothered by people bumping it, cats sitting on it, kids dropping toys or shoes on it. You wanna dedicate your space and a growing space that you bring a power strip over to. You want lights, you need a timer, you need heat mats and a fan. You should have some sort of structure you can attach your lights to that allow your lights to raise up and lower. There's going to be humidity around this setup because you have water and evaporation. So be prepared for that in wherever space that you choose. There are moisture trays that sit underneath your seeds that trap moisture. So be prepared that there's going to be some water on whatever surface you're using. There are good options for a grow station, a table, a shelf, a metal rack, or you can purchase a pre-made seed starter rack. Other items you're going to need, seed starter containers or trays. I have some here on the table and you'll see some in my slides in a minute water trays for the containers to sit on. These ones don't have drainage holes. These are the ones you're gonna be watering into that your, drink, your plants drink from. Humidity lids to trap humidity on the top, a timer, a fan, a power strip. Whatever container you start with, make sure that you're planting into something with excellent drainage. This is a big mistake a lot of people make, whether they're doing container gardens or they're planting seeds. If you don't have excellent drainage, you're going to have problems. Drainage is the key. You can start seeds in anything as long as it has that ability to hold your seed starter medium, your seeds, and it drains well. You can start in larger pots too. Remember, you're going to have to transplant into a bigger pot as your roots grow so that you can hold your root system and your seed starter. 
If you do start in a bigger pot though, you might be worried about your little tiny sprout as it's growing. So some people enjoy a much smaller seed starter and then moving it into bigger containers so they can tend to it as it gets larger. Also, you can forego your seed cell trays and directly plant into the moisture tray on the bottom. That is the flat container with no holes at all. That's kind of like um, planting into a brownie tray, right? And then you can cut your seeds out directly. Um, I like to do that. I plant in winter so like that but you do have to be very careful about moisture because you don't have any way for your seeds to evaporate or to drink up any extra moisture that way, okay? It is easier to monitor your individual cells for diseases or problems or lack of germination. So the seed cells are very, very popular. And actually some companies sell teeny tiny little um, peat, cells or coir cells that you can plant a seed in. So it's an individual little cell and you can put those in your moisture tray and they will puff up and your seed goes in there and you can watch it individually and then plant that out when it's time to go. The humidity domes are something that you can choose to have or not have. Some people don't like them and they use a wet kitchen cloth on top of their soil. And then as their sprouts come up, they remove it. So that's an option as well. Remember your seedlings will eventually need to be repotted. So be prepared for that. The first leaves do appear and that is when you're going to need to repot and feed your seedlings. We'll get there in a second. Some great veggies to start in trays, celery, eggplant, collards, kale, broccoli, kohlrabi, leeks, onions, peppers, scallions, and tomatoes. All of those things do really well when you're growing them inside on a rack. Let's talk about our seed starter. You do not want to start seeds in potting mix or soil from your garden or compost. Does anyone know why? Okay. Your seeds have the teeniest, tiniest hair-like roots when they come out of their shells and start to germinate. And they need the finest of materials to come down into. And soil is just too dense. And if you're getting it from your garden, you have no idea what you're really dealing with unless you are a superstar of a gardener and you have the finest of soil even then that soil is too dense. So we recommend, we being gardeners who start lots and lots of seeds, using a soilless seed starting mix. This one is mine. I use this and I have wonderful germination rates with my indoor racks and with winter sowing. I love this mix. This works great. This is very similar to Mel's mix, which is used in square foot gardening, which is a similar style of gardening. And it is a fantastic light and fluffy mix that allows little tiny roots to get down into the mix and start perfectly. Seed starting mix is a soilless medium used for growing plants from seed. It's finer and lighter, and you're going to get happier seedlings in the soilless mix. I like to add worm castings to your soil list mix because it aerates and it improves overall structure while providing beneficial nutrients. As the plants start to develop their first sets of leaves, they lose all of the rest of the nutrients that are encapsulated in the seed. So when a, a seedling first begins, it has all of the nutrients it needs in its actual seed. But once it puts out its first leaves, it has no more nutrients to tap from and it needs to be fed. So at that point, you're either transplanting it out and hoping someone's not gonna eat it like a bird or a bunny, or you're going to transplant it into a larger cell and continue to take care of it in your rack and start to feed it. But if you put a little bit of worm casting in your mix, 
that worm casting begins to feed your seedlings before you need to feed it with some fish emulsion or some gentle um, fertilizer, okay? I love worm castings. Worm castings are super beneficial. They're not a fertilizer. It is a soil amendment. Um, and it has all of the microbiology that belongs in soil. It has the perfect balance of the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the potassium that is in soil. It makes it easier for your plants to absorb its food. And it has some repelling uh, attributes to it to prevent aphids and spider mites from messing with your baby little plants. So it is a great beneficial. I put it in all of my garden beds, but I love it for starting seeds. Mm -hmm. So just quickly, my starter uh, mix is always, for me, coconut coir and not peat moss, and I'll explain that in a second, vermiculite, perlite, if I'm not using vermiculite, and I'll explain that in a second, some garden lime, if you're using peat moss, and some worm castings. Now, about peat moss. Peat moss is a non-sustainable resource that is actually banned the world over, except for in the US. It comes from peat bogs that are a beautiful and wonderful resource in our world. And in order to get peat moss out, they are ravaging these amazing wetlands of bogs and often they catch on fire during the process. It takes a thousand years for peat bogs to restore themselves. And this is why there is a ban and a boycott on peat moss the world over. It is an ecosystem that is being destroyed by the gardening industry because people think that they need peat moss to amend their soil. And the truth is that you don't. It is only truly useful for starting seeds. It doesn't do that much different or that much better than leaf mold. And it definitely isn't better than coconut coir. Coconut coir actually is a much better option. It is sustainable. It comes from the coconut industry, which is entirely sustainable in that a coconut tree is entirely replaceable in five to seven years. And coconut coir, which is the stuff on the outside of the coconuts, can be added to your soil and stays in your soil to help retain moisture and give humus to your soil, which is what peat moss has been used for. And it stays in there for three years, as opposed to peat moss, which decomposes within a year or a season. So it's a much, much better option. It's sustainable and it's replacing peat moss everywhere in the world as a garden option. So I recommend coconut coir. A lot of our soil bags and our seed starter bags that you would find in the nursery still have peat moss in them, which is why it's in my recipe. Because if you happen to buy a bag of seed starter, you're going to see peat moss in it but I recommend avoiding it at all costs because we don't wanna destroy our planet, right? Right, okay. Here's some other supplies that you're gonna to need to get started. Your seeds, you wanna gather all your seed packets together. That's your information. And you don't wanna go willy nilly with this. If you throw seeds in containers and you don't mark them and you don't know what you're doing, you're gonna get lost, you're gonna get overwhelmed. Suddenly you're gonna be growing things and not know where they go or know how big they're gonna get. And you're gonna be planting things and have a crazy garden and things are gonna get a little scary on you, okay? You wanna have a notebook, keep track of what you're doing. Gardeners are scientists and we're explorers and we're figuring out things and we're sharing our knowledge with others. And the best thing is when you're taking good care of your garden, you're taking good care of yourself, <laughs> Your plants are happy and they're dividing and you can share with others and you make new friends. It's a great experience. You want labels. You want labels and labels where the marks on your labels don't wear off. Now this is tricky and a lot of people's labels wear off, but I have found the answer. You wanna get a China marker. 
These China markers are made out of this waxy material and they don't wear off. They don't come off in water. They don't come off in humidity. You can stick them out in the garden and a rainstorm and a thunderstorm will come and it will still say bachelor's buttons on your marker. They're wonderful. I have some there on the table. I have some here in my picture. They're fabulous and absolutely worth the expense. They're not even expensive, but it's worth having a whole bunch of them and using plastic cut up blinds and making markers for your seeds and keeping them on your rack so that you know what you're doing. You want some gloves if you feel inclined. If you're dealing with soil and you don't know where it's coming from and it's not organic, please use gloves, save your body from chemicals. And I like to use a large mixing bowl. I have one here for mixing up my seed starter and making sure it's nice and well mixed before I put it in my containers and before I plant. When you are mixing, especially if you're using coconut coir, you want to mix that up with a lot of water before you put it in your containers because it will rehydrate and you need to do that before you put it in the containers. If you try to put it in the containers dry and then water it, it will shrink by half and you will go, where did it go? Oh no, where did it go? So definitely mix it in a, a container before you put it into your seed cells. Let's talk a little bit about lighting. Dedicated grow lights are necessary to produce quality plants from seed. One of the biggest mistakes is not providing adequate lighting, resulting in weak and scrawny seedlings. Lights need to be on for 14 hours a day on a timer, one to two inches above your soil. And they need to get raised up as your seedlings grow. So this is what I'm talking about, about a committed experience of checking on your seeds, raising up your lights and making sure that they are not getting burnt and that they have space to grow. Whatever kind of setup you choose, make sure your lights can move up and down. Racks are wonderful for this. So you can attach your lighting on chains and raise them up or clip lights that have flexible and bendable necks. I happen to have clip lights with bendable necks. That's what I like for my house. So I can move them up and down, they're easy. Fluorescents use their energy to produce more light than heat and are comparatively more efficient. They're the most common for urban gardeners and compact fluorescent lights fit into standard lamp sockets unlike tubes that require a ballast or a shop light fixture. LEDs are unique in their ability to produce a high quantity of light with lower energy requirements. And some models are producing more than twice the amount of light per watt compared to fluorescents. Some LED systems are designed to improve efficiency by delivering red and blue spectrums of light exclusively. And that's why some give off a purple glow, mine do. But you don't need that. Neutral white colored LEDs for home lighting will also work for seed starting. And you can buy LED tube lights that fit in your shop light ballast and require less energy than fluorescence. LEDs are held at a higher distance from your plants because of greater efficiency and higher photosynthetic active radiation. Incandescent bulbs give off more heat and less light than fluorescent tubes and are not gonna produce good transplants by themselves. Likewise, sunlight through a window is inconsistent because of our cloud cover and the days of uh, daylight, the hours of daylight are not enough for consistent seed starting in our region. Okay, heat mats are an added feature of your indoor seed starting rack that help to germinate your seeds more quickly and consistently. This is an essential part of your setup if you're starting seeds in an unparted, un unheated part of your home, like a garage or a laundry room, if you want these out of the way. Heat mats aren't expensive, but are very special. They help things germinate more evenly. For example, strawberry seeds have a fairly uneven rate of germination. If 20 seeds are planted, two might come up in the first week, some a week later, and the rest after a month or longer. They're very, very uneven. But if you put a heat mat underneath them, germination is far more even 
with most of the seeds woken up from dormancy after about 10 days. So that's wonderful. Then they're awake, you move the heat map to the next set of seeds. So it's pretty efficient. If you choose to forgo a heat mat, keep your seed trays in a warm location of your house, a tall shelf where heat rises next to a sunny window for heat, but not for sunlight, and nowhere that is drafty. Drafts are not good for plants, excuse me, especially little tiny seedlings. Uh, a word of caution, do not heat your seeds over 95 degrees. This will sterilize and kill your seeds. And then you'll wonder what happened and how come nothing's happening with your beautiful seeds. And some seed mats have thermometers that actually go into your soil and will turn on and off to tell your soil how warm it needs to be. <laughs> Humidity domes placed over your seedling trays will help trap in moisture and help your uh, seeds germinate faster as well. All right, if we're talking about planting, remember you're looking at your seed packets. Every seed is different. And I can give you some information about specific plants, but there are so many choices. We could be here for weeks. So I'm giving you the basics overall and I can answer some specific questions. But as you can see with my seed binders, I happen to like to grow lots and lots of different things, okay? Your seed packets are really going to help you the most, and they're going to give you the most information about the length of time each seed needs, the specifics it needs as far as what depth it needs to be planted at, and the specifics, because some seeds like light to germinate and some like dark to germinate, and those things should be on your seed packets. And some don't like root disturbances, and those seeds cannot be sown indoors in a traditional seed starting setup. They need to be direct sown. You wanna always direct sow carrots, beans, melons, cucumbers, and okra. Those things do not like their roots disturbed. Some nurseries will put those out for you, but chances are you'll lose some of them because they really don't like to be messed with at all. Your quick growers like radishes, they go from seed to harvest in 45 to 50 days. They have teeny little small root systems. There's no reason to start them on a rack. Just plant them outside and they will come right up and give you delicious spicy little radishes. You can also extend your season with seeds that love being grown indoors, what we call our, our cool season crops like your large and long plants, the broccoli, the cauliflower, the kales, the mustards, and the cabbages, and move them out as soon as your soil can be worked and get something in on your rack. Um, your Brussels sprouts, those can start four to six weeks before your last frost, and then they can go directly outside. Leeks, onions, chives, and beets are less happy about being started indoors, but I've successfully done that and moved them outside. They don't like it. They're not happy. They will shock and act like they're dying, but they will perk back up. Talk to them, plants like that. Um, celery is not frost friendly, but it really likes cool weather. So you can start it on a rack and then take it outside. It likes the cooler weather and it really prefers to be grown in cool conditions. Uh, after you've moistened your soil medium in your bowl and you put it into your seed cells, now it's time to sow your seeds. And there are two camps on seed starting. There's the waste and the waste not camps. And you get to decide which one you're in. I don't like thinning seedlings. I feel guilt and I don't enjoy that at all. And you get to decide who you are and where you are in this um, argument, okay? If this is you, you're in really good company. There's lots of us. Um, but if you're okay with less than fantastic germination, you can diverge from your seed packet and you can sow one seed per cell so you don't have to thin like me, and then you'll have a very accurate idea of your germination rate too, because you'll know exactly how many of your seeds are going to actually germinate from your packet. But if you are comfortable with thinning and you don't care so much about your germination rate, 
you can place two or four seeds on the soil or in the soil, depending on the size of your seed and what your seed packet requires. And then you will have growing seeds in every single cell and you will feel so accomplished and you will have beautiful plants growing, but then you have to thin them because those little seedlings are going to start competing for nutrients and resources and you have to thin them or they will kill each other and you don't want that, okay? If your seeds are very small, like basil or mustard, leave them uncovered. They're going to germinate without soil on the top. Put them on the top of the soil, don't cover them up. If your seeds are larger, like beans or peas or nasturtium, they require darkness to germinate. Check your instructions on your seed packets, but cover them with just a layer of vermiculite, just light, light vermiculite, or just a teeny tiny bit of the seed starter mix and they will uh, come up beautifully. The general rule is that you want to bury your seed the same depth as the size of the seed. So if you have a big seed, you wanna plant it the depth of the size of the seed. And if you have a teeny tiny seed, you wanna just lay it on the top of the soil and gently press it into the top, okay? But please don't be surprised if some seeds don't germinate. Don't get mad about it. It's just the way it goes. That's the way genetics works. That's the way seeds work. And remember, if you plant an entire tray in Brussels sprouts and you plant 60 Brussels sprout seeds, you might get 40 Brussels sprout plants that become giant six feet stalks of Brussels sprouts that all ripen at the same time and you have to eat them all at once. So plan ahead and think about that. Think about who you're going to feed all those Brussels sprouts to and where you have place to grow all of those giant, beautiful, glorious, silvery foliage Brussels sprouts. Plan ahead. It's important, especially when you're starting from seed. It's not like going to a nursery and picking up one little plant and saying, Oh, I think I might have a spot for this. Some of your plants are going to be perennials and they'll come back every year too. So you might want to think about that. Rhubarb comes back, asparagus comes back, strawberries come back. If we're talking about vegetables and with flowers, many, many, many of them come back. So no, and put in your journal, this is going to come back. Draw out your garden and plan for where things are going to go. Also, when you're putting things on your rack, try to put things on your rack in plant families. Plant families make sense because they have similar growing conditions. Some things are heavier feeders. Some things need less water. We'll get to that in a second. Um, a quick note, a lot of people are very interested in natives right with our ecosystem and our climate crisis, natives are super important and they're important for our pollinators and our birds. I have an entire class coming up about natives and I will talk about growing natives and germinating natives in that class. There are some tips and tricks for natives and they're a little bit different. Growing natives takes patience and some natives don't germinate the whole first year. Some of them don't flower for a couple of years. Natives are especially fond to my heart, but I'm not gonna cover them in this class, okay? This chart is all about our plant families. There are some very big complex Latin names here, but I'm just gonna give you our American names because they make more sense and they are the grouping of our families for your seeds so that you can pull things together as your seeds starting. It's very helpful for understanding plant families and it's really useful for putting things together on your racks. For instance, um, garlic and onions and chives, asparagus and shallots, those are all one family. Put them together on your rack. Look at your seed packets. They all require very similar watering conditions. Um, carrots. Carrots are very similar to um, the 
other roots, but they also have similarities with um, sweet acillium and some other flowers. So put them together on your racks. They have similarities with dill. They're the same family and cilantro and parsley and fennel. Um, arugula and broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, kale, and kohlrabi, kohlrabi are all uh, brassicas, and they all grow similarly. They also have all the same pests. So making sure that you grow them similarly on your racks and making sure they have the same light and the same food is important. Okay. Germination is a process plant or seed or a spore has to go through to produce a living, growing or breathing seedling. It's much like a revival of metabolic systems after a period of dormancy. Do you remember what plants need? They need placement, liquid, air, nutrients, temperature and sunlight. Some seeds are really fussy about perfect light conditions when germinating, we mentioned this already. Some plants like asparagus, beans, beets, and carrots opt for dark and humid germination experiences, while broccoli, cauliflower, peppers need just a tiny fraction of light, so they want less to sprout. Some perennials and epiphytes like ferns and orchids and some grasses need a sprinkling of soil to come up, and some need solid light, like coleus and begonia and primula and petunia. They need to be in bright, bright light with no soil on them at all to come up. Uh, calendula and alliums are actually inhibited by light and need to be fully, fully covered. So every seed is different, every family is different. That's why you need to look at your seed packets and do your research, okay? You know your plants are ready for some nutrients when you see their true leaves starting to appear. Those first true sets of leaves are called their cotyledons and their first true leaves are the second sets of leaves. You see here, the very first leaves you see that come up right here, they don't count. Those are the baby leaves. The first true leaves look different and those are the ones you're looking for. When those come up, your seeds begin to get hungry. So you wanna give them a boost. You wanna give them some food. Ideally, your food is gonna contain some trace nutrients and some minerals, some other organic components like humic acid, but it can't find that in a seed starter mix, right? Mm -hmm. And we want seed starter mix so we have nice little root systems. My favorite thing to feed our seedlings are a seaweed or a fish immers immers immersion uh, fertilizer, uh, excuse me, emulsion. I'm stumbling over my words, excuse me. But I like to put it in a very diluted form so that I'm not hurting my plants or overfeeding them. So I usually do a one fourth solution of fish fertilizer to water and I gradually increase the concentration as the plants get larger, but I keep it at one fourth um, for quite a while until those plants are ready to go outside. Fertilizer has three different nutrients. I mentioned this before um, that are in fertilizers and they don't usually cover all the micronutrients. That's where the worm castings come in to help. But the main nutrients are the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the potassium. Nitrogen helps with development of leaves and uh, production of chlorophyll, which is responsible for the green color in the leaves. Phosphorus helps develop roots and produces flowers and fruits. And potassium also helps with roots and develops strong stems. All really, really important. Herbs are always an area of interest. Everyone wants to learn about herbs and how to grow them successfully. I'm gonna jump in here and say most herbs are really easy to grow from seed. And these seeds tend to be teeny tiny, so almost all of them just get placed on the top of the soil with almost nothing on top of them. Um, put a few in every cell, even if it goes against your feelings. It's important. They will come up. You don't even need to thin them. They will thin themselves. 
Most herbs are very resilient and they help each other out and the strongest of them will survive. There are a few that are difficult. That's lavender. The flavored mints are difficult. Rosemary can be difficult and white sage and bay leaf. Bay leaf is actually a tree um, and that's a whole nother conversation. Um, but all of these herbs are very easy to grow. I have heard people struggling with cilantro, but if you are, come and talk to me. It's pretty simple. I will make sure that you are successful with your cilantro. All right, here are the mistakes that we want to avoid. In order to get your timing right, the very first thing you need to know is your average last frost date. For us right now, According to the USDA plant hardiness zone six, which is where we live, our average last frost date in the spring is May 15th. Now this changes. In fact, they changed our US plant hardiness zone map because of climate change. And they took it away from a physical map and put it online so that they can update it because of climate change changing fast. So if you are not certain what zone we're in, um, check because we changed uh, in the last 30 years and we're changing faster than they expected. So you can always go online to see what's happening. In fact, they had to add three different zones in the last 30 years, which they did not expect to have to do, which is a little bit alarming, but we're here to solve the climate crisis by fixing the soil and teaching people about the climate, right? We're doing this. Um, if you start butternut squash seeds at the end of summer, you're not going to get any squash. You're going to get some pretty plants, but you're not going to get any squash. They do need warm soil to germinate, and they can be really finicky about root disturbance. So if you plant them in the summer, you're doing the right thing. But you have to remember, these guys take 110 days to germinate and mature. So how long was our growing season? 170 days. So you have to plan ahead. You have to make sure you plant them with enough time that they have that 110 days from germination to maturity if you want butternut squash. And then you have to take care of them to make sure that those pests don't come in and mess with your vines and hurt your plant so that you can actually get those butternut squash at the end of the season. If you toss seeds out to the wind and plant willy nilly, you're not gonna get the, the results that you desire. Read your seed packets, take notes, stay organized, you will do great. Make sure you take the time and make your plant labels. Okay, that's really important. Start with the best soil you can afford. This is also really important. Use heat mats, super important. It helps with your consistency of your germination. Invest in lights, get the lights. Please don't put your poor little seedlings in the window and hope for the best. It won't work. You might get a couple and say, ha ha, but it won't work the next time. And then you'll be really sad, okay? Do daily watering checks and water from below. You wanna use your water trays, don't water from above. You will disrupt your seedlings or disrupt your seeds. So if you water from below, you're actually watering the roots. And that's the best way to do that. You also don't wanna overwater. So check by sticking your finger in the soil and see if the plant needs water. Don't just assume. Stick with diluted liquid fertilizer at a quarter strength after your first sets of true leaves. Do not use granular plant foods or fertilizers. You can burn your plants and kill your seedlings. If you planted more than one seed, you must not forget to thin your seedlings. Many, many nurseries sell plants with several seedlings in the container and they don't tell you and you think, oh yay, now I have three plants. But what you really have are three starving seedlings that are competing for nutrients. And the best way to make sure one of them survives is to kill the other two. It's not a good idea to try to thin them and save three. You will have three almost dead plants because they've been competing for nutrients since they emerged, okay? Hardening off, we're gonna to get to this. This is really important. And the very last thing I promise, it's hard work and all will be lost if you do not harden off 
properly. It is the last and most important step of starting seeds traditionally from a rack, okay? Make sure you do this gradually to make sure your babies acclimate to the outdoor conditions properly. It is very easy to shock your plants. It's very easy to kill your plants during the hardening off process. And I believe that in our um, unpredictable conditions here in Pittsburgh, it's very easy to make mistakes when you're hardening off. Five sure steps to take when it's time for your transplanting, hardening off. Stop feeding and watering a week prior so that your seedlings and your plants are a little bit crazy. They're a little bit starving. They don't know what you're doing to them. You wanna take them outside and get them ready for the big move. You want them to get accustomed to the colder outdoor temperatures that are different than the perfect temperatures of those warm, gorgeous spring conditions you've created on your mats, right? You wanna take them outside and you wanna put them in a place where it is overcast and cool, but not hot and blazing, you'll burn them and kill them. And you want to do this for small amounts of time and gradually increase. You wanna put them in a place where they can have some coverage from wind because wind will shock them and also cover from torrential downpours that will shock them. And you wanna very carefully increase your amount of time that you're toting them in and out in this game of hardening off that is a dance really, you're dancing with your plants, bringing them in and out and in and out. And this is really important. If you can do this, you will have amazing plants that are gorgeous and ready to live outdoors. When you bring them out, you bring them out, you let them sit for a while, you bring them back in. Once they're acclimated to being outside for a few hours, you're gonna give them some covering so that when it does rain, they're not getting pummeled. You might take a piece of cardboard and put it around your plant to give them a little bit of a, a tenting so they can get water around the roots or around the rain line, we like to call it the drip line, but not get totally drenched and destroyed on their tiny little fragile stems. You're gonna to continue to harden off and harden off an hour longer each day for this two week period of this dance of bringing your seeds in and out. And you're gonna keep an eye on your nighttime temperatures as they warm up and warm up to decide whether or not you're ready to let them come outside for the night. Um, some plants like onions can handle freezing temperatures that tomatoes cannot handle. So be careful with what you're taking out. Some things are just more delicate than others. Again, this is researching, this is experience, and this is your seed packets. Your seed packets will give you information about this too. They, it will say, be careful of frost or not frost tolerant on your seed packet. Uh, for instance, um, cabbages will bolt if they're put outside when it's too warm, which means that they will shoot up and produce seeds and flowers and not create a cabbage for you. Um, and you don't want them to sit out in really, really cold temperatures either because they will freeze. They're a little bit picky, but cabbages are picky anyway. So just be warned about cabbages. Um, place your seedlings near a wall so that they have a little bit of uh, insulation and care. The wall will warm them up a little bit on the cool nights when you're ready to put them out at night. So it's nice to give them a little bit of a hug from a warm building or a brick wall at night because they're going to be acclimating to these changes of temperature instead of this perfect even temperature of their seed rack, okay? And really pay attention to the weather because Pittsburgh is a little bit unpredictable and you might lose everything. All of this amazing work you've done, all these beautiful plants and then whoosh, they're all dead the next day. You're gonna feel pretty upset. A few days before you actually transplant. So you've gotten your seeds out. They're all beautiful, hardened off. The temperatures have gotten nice and warm and springy and everybody's ready to go in the ground. You want to give them all a 
good drink of the liquid fertilizer and you want to prepare where you're gonna put them in the garden, you wanna dig the holes before you take them out of their pots, get everything ready and put a little bit of granular fertilizer in the holes before you put them in the ground. That gives them a boost. It's like an extender for them at the root before they grow. So you're gonna be feeding them from the top every couple of weeks and give them some food because they can't get food from nowhere. And they're going to eventually have nice, strong and robust systems where they can access nutrients from the soil. But when they're babies, the first thing you wanna do is get their roots strong so that they can deal with the weather and deal with the conditions of being outdoors. Um, and really, the day that you plant them, you want to pick perfect weather conditions. And what I mean by that is overcast and cool. That's perfect planting conditions, or even a little sprinkly. Those are perfect gardening days. You don't want too hot because your plants will suffer and they will shock, okay? And just handle them very carefully. These are your babies. When you take them out of the container, don't rough them up, don't yank on them, don't rip your roots. Be gentle and careful and talk to them, talk to your plants. It matters, it matters. Um, how deeply should they be planted? Each plant is different, um, but every plant should be planted just below the surface and then have some beautiful amended soil or some finished compost added around the tops of the plants. That way the microbiology in the soil will come to the plant and help it integrate with the soil around it. Um, let's move on. Direct seeding. This is important. There are some seeds that you have to plant outside, right? These are the ones that don't like their roots being bothered or ones that like to grow in warm conditions outside with shorter seasons and windows. These are things that we know about that are listed here, right? Our beans, our corn, our beets, peas, radishes. All these things like to be grown directly outside. Don't bother putting them on a rack. They're not gonna be happy that way. They really have this immense shoot of growth straight from the ground and they're so fun to watch. Nature's warmed up the soil. It's warmed up the air. You can see on their packet that they have a much, much shorter season. Maybe it's 50 days, maybe it's 60 days, maybe it's 30 days. So you know that you're gonna be planting these somewhere in the middle of the summer or in the late spring, if you're gonna do two different um, succession plantings of the same crop. And some, uh, flowers like that too, like bachelor's buttons and sweet peas and larkspur, they like to be directly sown. They do not want to be grown and then transplanted. Um, incidentally, I brought my seed binders because I organize my seeds by the length of time that they need to grow. That way I can figure out what I'm going to plant first and what I'm going to plant last and what succession things I want to plant. That way, in the very beginning of the year, I can say, aha, these melons need 120 days. This corn needs 110 days. This radish needs 30 days. And I can figure out where in my garden I'm going to plant what. And I can spend my winter planting my beds in my brain and planning everything out and flipping through my binders. I'm also a seed collector and a trader, and I have seeds that go way back. In fact, I planted some Coreopsis that is from um, many, many, many years ago um, in hopes that it would grow, and it did. So you can store your seeds the correct way. I store my binders in a deep chest freezer so that my seeds stay safe, and I have fabulous germination rates. So I don't mess with my seeds, but I keep plenty and I trade lots. And that's really fun to do. And you make lots of friends that way. Um, some other secrets. I'm going to tell you about carrots. Lots of people have trouble with carrots. But a secret to growing carrots is to direct plant them outside. Put them in so you don't have to thin them a lot because I'm not a thinner. I don't like that at all. And then put a board on top of them, a wood board, untreated, 
pine, cedar, oak, whatever you have laying around. And that board insulates the seeds and traps heat and moisture. All you have to do is lift up the board and check under it for the first week or so. And once those seeds begin to pop, you lift up the board. And voila, you've created a seed starting system for your carrots. Nobody's coming to pull your seeds out of the ground. No birds are eating your seeds. No rabbits are coming to bother your carrots. And the board has helped your seeds to stay warm and safe. And if your soil is nice and light and friable and doesn't have rocks in it, you'll get really nice straight carrots. So that's a little carrot secret from me to you. Okay. So today I've really shared with you the joys and challenges of traditional seed starting in our gardens. I hope that I can appeal to you to consider this do no evil approach to gardening. This is my littlest daughter in one of the gardens in Connecticut that we were growing. Uh, it's really important to me as we embrace in our industry and hobby gardeners and enthusiasts, sustainability in gardening for today and for the next 20 or 30 years to try to help save our planet. We are in attempting to enhance our soil, to capture carbon and to teach people and as many people as we can about eco-friendly practices, sustainable and organic gardening. I hope that I was able to teach you some things today that were helpful and educational. I hope you are able to make some educated decisions about what you can buy and make some responsible and sustainable choices. Um, in our next class in this series, which is happening in August, it's the second part of this class, I teach about companion planting. I teach about square foot gardening. And I teach about some other more advanced seed starting techniques. And I think it's very useful to learn that side of it as well, even if you're a beginner, um, because there's a lot of wonderful organic methods that you can use with some secrets thrown in that I can help you uh, have to make your garden a really wonderful and joyful place. I have some reference slides with some information if you're interested. Today we did cover indoor seed starting and direct seed starting. Here you'll see, oh, we also are covering a food forest, which I'm very excited about. Permaculture is a, an emerging field where we're helping to sequester carbon, but also recreate natural ecosystems and food systems all together. So we're gonna be covering that in August. I also have a couple other classes I'm gonna be teaching here in uh, June and July, and those flyers are here and they're up on the internet if you're watching us on Zoom. Does anyone have any questions? On Zoom or in person? I'd be happy to answer any. Coconut core. Okay, you can find coconut core online. You can also find it at many specialist nurseries. Um, I happened to get mine at Costco this year. Um, they did have it at the beginning of the season, but all the gardening stuff gets swiped up really fast. I filled up the whole back of my car the day I found it um, because it was a great price and because I really love coconut coir, but you can find it on Amazon. Um, just look up coconut coir. It's sold in bricks and they're not heavy weight. But when you unwrap a brick, you have to uh, hydrate it. You have to fill it up with water and it expands to three times its size because it's been compressed. But it is an absolutely valuable resource and it's absolutely worth putting into your beds because it's humus. It's wonderful organic matter that your garden will thank you for. Yeah. Anything else? <laughs> Too many, yeah, and there's a lot of information. But, you know, anything you think of, I'll try to answer for you. Um, I, I have a question. I'm online. <laughs> and um, can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Yeah, okay, great. So you covered a lot of great information, and I really appreciate it. Um, one thing I was wondering if you could just review quickly, and um, this pertains to me starting just not very many, but some um, flower seeds 
And so I have my little seedlings and they're tiny. And, and, and I have a couple in there that are competing. And you had said that you really have to separate those as soon as possible, right? Because they're competing for nutrients. Is, is that what you said? Yeah, you have to kill them. When you're starting seeds and you're thinning, mm -hmm. the only way, um, yeah, the only way to make sure the ones that you keep stay alive is to thin. And um, when you're doing that in a traditional seed starting setting, you need little tiny shears and you just cut them off so that the roots stay in the soil and become nutrients for the ones you're keeping. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why it's and not then good. how soon do I, so I need to transfer them at some point to, to a little bigger, tiny, you know, like a little bigger pot. Cause right now they're just in the little, you know, starter ones. Okay. Well, if you're ready to do that, you can very delicately try to unwind the roots and plant them separately and have two. Mm -hmm. But then you need to feed them. You need to give them some fish emulsion um, and see if they'll both survive that way because they've both been trying to survive in the first tiny little pot. Okay. Flowers and, and are a little I, different than vegetables. Yes, I, I, I thought so. And a couple of those seedlings, I mean, they, they've, they've dried out. You know, they just were so tiny and thin and, and I'm not sure I have them in a somewhat sunny location, but not direct light. And I just wondered if the temperature wasn't right because I don't have any of the equipment that you've talked about. I took good notes today, but I just thought I'm gonna give this a try and see how I do. Yeah. So do, do you think they got too, too warm, the ones that dried out? I'm not certain. I mean, I don't know your setup, but that could possibly be it. Um, yeah. Having a fan that moves air around your setup is really essential for a lot of people. Um, mm -hmm. And also making sure that your plants are watered from below so that your soil doesn't get dried out because plants need uh, adequate drinks um, and liquid in order to get larger. But uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, I can't really answer that unless I see, um, but that absolutely could be the case. Okay. Okay. All right. And I took some notes about what you said about hardening off and all of that. And I guess, is that pretty, you know, pretty much the same for flower seeds yes. as well? Yes, as because all of those things will shock if you just put them outside. And actually that goes for nursery plants too. Although it's mm -hmm. not as drastic when you get plants from the nursery, because mm -hmm. those have already been moved outside most yes. of the time, but you still need to be careful. You'll notice if you buy plants from the nursery, and you put them in the ground right away, often they'll shock. Um, mm -hmm. So the best thing to do if you get plants from a nursery or grow plants from seed is to treat them as if you've grown them from seed and try to harden them off a little bit. Give them the delicate treatment for a day or two and bring them in and out a little bit and get them used to your little microclimate and the area that you want to plant them in so that they have the best chance of success. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. This was You're really great. And I really welcome. appreciate it. You're welcome. Anyone else? Maybe one last question. Miriam, there's another question in the chat. Sure. Um, can you see it? Or do you want me to read it? Uh, should you direct sow companion plants at the same time? Is that the question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so companion planting is a technique that uses uh, chemicals that are growing around the roots or from the plant to protect one plant or to deter one plant from another, and also to attract beneficial insects or deter uh, insects that want to eat one plant from another. So if you're growing plants inside on a rack, the companion plants don't matter really at that time. The companion planting really takes effect when you get them to where you're going to grow them and they start to grow into full size. Companion planting is definitely an art and a science, and it is a fantastic way to enhance your garden um, and protect and secure the health of your plants. 
but I don't think it's necessarily applicable when you're starting seeds because your seeds are just trying to come up and they don't have the same benefits on a rack, I don't think. I hope that was a good enough answer. <laughs> I think that might be it, Mark. Um, I think so. Are there any other questions? I don't see any more in the chat. No, nope, I think that's it here too. <laughs>